They know what they know, but they don't know what you know. They're not as mature as you. They're not as wise as you. They don't know what you know. They don't know that everything on their plate is good for them. They don't understand that everything on their plate is healthy and will make them grow big and strong. They don't know that even the unpleasant tasting, nasty looking thing on their plate will be beneficial to them. They don't know what you know, because if they did, they would have ordered exactly what is on their plate. Are you getting this? My family is the most valuable asset that I have. It gives me pleasure when I assist them. It fulfills the fatherliness in me to do things for them that they can't do for themselves. Now, I stress the word can't there. If they can do it themselves, it's up to them. I saw a picture the other day of a man holding a shovel. And the caption said something like, if God has given you a shovel, don't just stand there and pray for a hole. If you can do it yourself, you do it yourself. When our kids were growing up, they didn't always understand. Like most kids, they sometimes fell under the misconception that Lisa and I were rich. They grew so used to us providing for them and giving to them that sometimes they thought it was an easy thing. They didn't consider the sacrifices that we made. They didn't know the things that Lisa and I did without so we could give them what they wanted. And occasionally, they got this crazy idea that we did it for them out of obligation. You kids get that idea? We were their parents and they were our children, so somehow they came to believe that we owed it to them, totally missing the point that what we did for them was out of our love for them. Nevertheless, the only thing that I ever wanted for my children as their father was appreciation and gratitude for the things that they received from me. All I ever wanted was a smile or a hug or a thank you. I needed my kids to recognize that what they received from me was given out of love and not out of obligation. I wanted them to recognize that what they received from me had a purpose for them. That's how God is. Sometimes we forget about the great love that God has for us. Sometimes we forget that what God does for us, he's not obligated to do. Sometimes we forget the great price that he paid for us, and sometimes we forget the sacrifice that he made for us. Sometimes we're so wrapped up in what we want and what we need that we forget about what God needs from us and why and how he is involved in our life. As a born-again believer, we have a relationship with our creator. Our connection to God isn't religion. It isn't an association, but it is family. What we have is a father-to-child relationship. That's why God refers to himself as our father, and he refers to us as his children. As a Christian, we have a family relationship with our creator. We have a never-ending blood bond with God the Father through Jesus Christ. But there are conditions that must be met in order for that relationship to work like it's supposed to work. As a father, I want to give my children love, but they have to be open to receive that love. As a father, I want to give them forgiveness because as their father, I just want them to stop doing the wrong things and just get it right. But they have to be open to receive my forgiveness. And most importantly, I want them to live righteously so I can bless them. When the prodigal son left his father's house, he moved out from under his father's covering. And when he did, he moved outside of his father's hedge of protection and he moved away from his father's blessing. The father wanted to supply for his son's needs, and he wanted to protect his son, but he could no longer do any of those things because his son had moved outside of his covering. Listen closely, Christian. That is the frustration that God sometimes feels toward you and me. He isn't sitting on his throne in heaven just waiting for us to mess up so he can strike us down. If God needs evidence to condemn us, he already has plenty. God doesn't want to hear us beg and plead for his assistance. 
He doesn't want us to suffer or to hurt or to do without. He doesn't get some sadistic pleasure out of seeing us struggle or to wander aimlessly through life because God is the ultimate Father. He loves us and he wants to bless us and reward us and fulfill us, but he can't do any of those things if we're living our life outside of his will. God can't be a father to us if we leave the house and we don't allow him to be our father. There are obligations that must be met by you and me. We might still be his child, and we might, but we might as well not be his child because our rebellion has moved us away from him and has hindered God's fatherliness. Our rebellion has severed the father-child relationship so, so that it can no longer function like it's supposed to. Our rebellion has frustrated that relationship. So there are conditions that have to be met for our relationship with God to work. Now before I go on, I want you to understand that I'm not teaching you a prosperity gospel here. What I'm teaching you has nothing to do with that, so don't get confused. God isn't obligated to make you rich. He isn't obligated to spoil you with all of your fleshly lust. God owes you nothing. God owes you nothing. What God has is his, and what you have is his. You can't control him, and you can't obligate him to serve you. So I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel here. The prosperity gospel is for shallow people who want no commitment, but they still want a reward. It's for people who want to use a system or a formula or a magical incantation to get God to do for them what they want without any obligation on their part. It is selfish and fleshly, and it's not from the Word of God. So that's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about here is a relationship. I'm talking about righteousness and obedience and holiness. I'm talking about doing things God's way and living your life in God's will so that in return you will fulfill the fatherliness in your creator. I'm thoroughly convinced that God, a loving Heavenly Father, wants to do great things in our lives. He wants to show us that he is the ultimate father, but we sometimes frustrate him. And our behavior binds him so God can't do what he wants to do. If one of my children turned on me and rebelled against everything that I stood for and walked away from me, they would take themselves out of position to receive my blessing. I am still their father. I still want to bless them, but I can't bless them because of the way they're living. I can't be who I am in their life because they've removed their self from me. They have moved outside of my hedge and they moved outside of my covering. They have broken all of my rules and they have left the house. They're still my child, but their actions have frustrated our relationship. Do you understand what I'm telling you? It would break my heart. I would, I would want to scream at him, why don't you just straighten up so I can help you? Why don't you come home so I can bless you? That's exactly how God feels about you and me. But sometimes we don't get it. A friend of mine likes to use the phrase SSS, so simple, stupid. You ever use that? Obedience is the key that unlocks the door to our relationship with God. It is so simple, stupid. But sometimes we don't get it. We're we're so bent on having our own way. We're so determined to do our own thing and so set on going our own direction that we leave the Father's house and we rob ourselves of what God our Father can do for us. It is so simple. Simple, stupid. Have you ever said to your child, clean up your plate and we'll go get some ice cream? You ever say that? Oh, come on. Woody, I know. you. you well, you didn't say it to your child, but I know you go get ice cream all the time. <laughs> clean up your plate and we'll go get ice cream. Our kids aren't home anymore, so Lisa and I just say it to each other. You really want to give them ice cream. You've already pictured in your mind this sweet child of yours with a big smile on their face as they're cleaning up their plate. You picture yourself taking them by the hand and skipping down the street to the local Dairy Queen where you order for them this big chocolate cone with sprinkles and a smiley face. You have this image in your mind of them getting ice cream all over their face and the whole family laughing together in a Kodak family moment. But how often does that happen? Clean up your plate and we'll go get ice cream. You're trying to teach your child a principle. You're trying to teach them obedience. And that with obedience comes blessing. You're trying to teach them what is best for them. But what do they do? They refuse to cooperate. 
They refuse to be obedient. They refuse to clean up their plate, and nobody gets ice cream. They don't get ice cream. You don't get ice cream. Nobody gets ice cream. They refuse to be obedient because on their plate are some things that they are unfamiliar with and uneducated about. On their plate is some kind of meat, a serving of potatoes, and a gnarly-looking green vegetable. Now, you know how this goes. They play around in their food for a while and, and eat little or nothing at all. So you remind them of your proposition. You remind them if they clean up their plate, they'll get ice cream. So reluctantly, your child chews down the meat, and they make some valiant effort and force down the potatoes. But there, like a cancer growing out of their plate, lies this hideous-looking green vegetable. They just know that people don't eat green things. Cows eat green things, goats eat green things, hogs eat green things, but people don't eat green things. And they want nothing to do with this nasty-looking vegetable. They know what they know, but they don't know what you know. They're not as mature as you. They're not as wise as you. They don't know what you know. They don't know that everything on their plate is good for them. They don't understand that everything on their plate is healthy and will make them grow big and strong. They don't know that even the unpleasant tasting, nasty looking thing on their plate will be beneficial to them. They don't know what you know because if they did, they would have ordered exactly what is on their plate. Are you getting this? Sometimes we don't know what God knows. God knows everything. He not only knows the past and the present, but God also knows every detail of the future. He knows what lies ahead. And knowing what lies ahead, he has charted our course and he has numbered our steps. And in God's divine wisdom and in his great love, he has placed some things in front of us that we do not understand. Am I talking to somebody here? I know I am. God has put some things on your plate that you do not want to deal with. How many of you have something on your plate right now you don't want to deal with? He's put something in your path that you know nothing about. And what you know, you don't like. But that's when you have to trust him and be obedient. Your child doesn't know what you know, so they stop eating. They refuse to obey. They'll, they'll go so far, but they'll only go so far. They'll eat everything but that one thing. And they refuse to clean up their plate. The only trouble is, they still want ice cream. How do you respond? Well, if your parent that's true to your word, if your parent that wants to make sure that your child understands that you have their best interest in mind, if you want them to learn to trust you and grasp the concept that obedience brings reward, they get no ice cream. But here's where some of you parents get in trouble. I've seen you. If your child throws a big enough fit, if they scream loud enough and cry long enough, they know that you will eventually break and cave and give in and they will get what they want without being obedient. That's why some of you are raising little monsters right now. If you do that one more time, and then they do it one more time. If you don't do that, but then they won't do it. Or my favorite is, I'm going to count to three. Let me tell you, if it's wrong at three, it was wrong at one. What you don't understand is that you're engraving in your child's mind a very dangerous scenario. You probably don't see it now, but I'm going to point it out to you. You're teaching your child that structure is irrelevant. You are the parent and they're the child. You're the adult and they are the child, but you're teaching them that there is no difference. You're teaching them that chaos rules. Instead of a parent-child relationship where you are in charge, you're giving them the idea that they rule your house. You're teaching them that rules are merely suggestions and none of them really apply. You're teaching them that they're in charge of the house and that they can control you. I want you to know God does not work that way. This country might work that way. 
The community might work that way, but God does not work that way. Shallow and immature Christians believe that their relationship with God works like that. There is no structure. They don't view God as the ultimate authority, but rather they see God as the Father, as God their servant, who's only there to do for them what they demand. And they believe that if they throw a big enough fit, if they get angry enough and complain enough, then God will give in. They think that God's word is merely a suggestion and they can live life as they choose, but God is still obligated to bless them. But God does not work that way. Your child refuses to obey. And as a parent, it breaks your heart because all your child had to do was one good thing. All they had to do was one right thing. The only thing that you asked them was just for an act of obedience, but they have refused. So what happens next? You know how it works. There's an argument. There's a standoff. They're at one end of the street. You're at the other. It's high noon. The hat's pulled down over their eyes and their hands on their sticks gun. They're screaming and there's crying and there's turmoil. There is chaos instead of what you really wanted. Just to give them ice cream. You and I live in a secret society. We're always in pursuit of something. We're always trying to fill a void. We're trying to fill a want or what we believe is a need. We're trying to find happiness and contentment and peace of mind. But all too often, we're looking in all of the wrong places. Sadly, even churches today have been caught up in the competition of trying to attract new members into their church. But instead of bringing them into the kingdom of God, they have become seeker-oriented. They've made themselves custom-crafted to attract people who are looking for a church that offers what they want instead of what they need. Instead of trying to find a church and a pastor that's preaching and teaching the truth of God's word that sometimes cuts through them like a two-edged sword, they look for a church that only serves ice cream. We're all born seekers. We've all come into this world searching for something that we can't identify. And we're almost always looking in the wrong places and at the wrong things. And ultimately, we're never satisfied. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 32, After all these things do the Gentiles seek. But you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God says, I understand that you're a seeker. I created you. I know what your desires are, and I know how your mind works, but don't waste the life that I've given you by seeking the wrong things in the wrong places, because that's exactly what the Gentiles do. Is there anyone here this morning who's of Jewish descent? Just curious. Great. Didn't know that. I have to keep that in mind come wedding day, right? Try to wrap your mind around this. Everybody here but you, we're all Gentiles. You're a Gentile, I'm a Gentile, I'm Gentile Jim. <laughs> Unless you've been born a Jew, you're a Gentile. Unless your mother and father are Jewish in the bloodline of Father Abraham, you are a Gentile. In the New Testament, God is very descriptive of the Gentiles, and the picture isn't pretty at all. Gentiles lived outside of the knowledge of God. They couldn't see God, they didn't know God, and they couldn't comprehend God. Spiritual matters were foreign to them. Therefore, they lived only in the flesh, and they existed only for their flesh. Even though God had created them as spiritual beings, as he did all of us, the Gentiles were not spiritual people. In Matthew 7, Jesus said to the Gentiles, seek after food, and they seek after clothing, and they seek after shelter. Their focus in life is on appeasing their flesh because they know nothing of the Spirit. They live for today, and they never think about eternity. It's a very easy way to live. Just live in the moment. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about your bad decisions. Don't concern yourself with the future. Don't think about eternity or heaven and hell. Just live for today. That's how the Gentiles lived. There are many people today who are slaves to their flesh. They're consumed by sin. They're guilty of breaking every commandment of God. They're always seeking something. They're seeking something that they can't identify and they will never find because they're seeking the wrong things in all of the wrong places. So they float from one high to the next, and even though they're briefly appeased, they're still always miserable because they are never satisfied. The Gentiles might not have considered themselves to be religious, but God made them spiritual beings. And as spiritual beings, they always worship something or someone. In 1 Corinthians, the Bible states that even though the Gentiles refused to humble themselves before the God of heaven, they bowed and worshiped to dumb idols and made sacrifices to demons. They always worship something. You see, everybody's religious about something. 
Everybody worships something. There's something in all of our lives that we give our time and our talent and our money. Just like the Gentiles, we are invested somewhere. Ephesians 4 says that they walk in the vanity of their minds. Professing themselves to be wise, they're but fools alienated from the life of God. 1 Thessalonians 4 describes them as entangled in the sin of concupiscence, lusting in the sensual desires of the mind in their body. 1 Peter 4 says that they're lascivious, they're out of control, given to excess in wine and fighting and partying to the worst degree. But to make matters worse, Matthew 20 says, because of these things, it's the Gentiles who mocked and scourged and crucified Jesus Christ all the time that they were seeking. You are guilty before God. You're naturally driven by the lust of your flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. You're always seeking, but you're seeking the wrong things in all the wrong places. And according to the scriptures, if you were living 2,000 years ago, because of your nature, you would have been part of the mob that hung Jesus on the cross. The scriptures I've just read and the sins that I've just spoken of describe what you deal with from day to day. They're the traps that you fall into. They're the powers that control you. And they're the vices that are killing you because they are the things that you, as a Gentile, naturally seek after. Being a Christian isn't natural. It goes against everything that you've ever known. So to be the child of God that you need to be, there is a conflict. There has to be a fight between the enemy that has lived inside of you and has controlled you. As a born-again believer, you are now a new creation in Christ, but there is now a conflict between the new you and the old you. There's a war going on between your new nature in Christ and your old nature of sin. While you, you view your new nature wants to be obedient to God and to live in Christ's will, your old nature is rebelling and there's conflict. Now, as a believer, you want to win this fight, but the trouble is every time you punch this enemy in the nose, it hurts your nose. And every time you bust him in the mouth, it busts your mouth, and every time you punch him in the gut, you get hit in the gut, and it's a very painful fight. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. What Jesus is telling us, if, if we want God's favor, we have to take ourselves out of the way. We have to remove our own agenda, our opinions, our will, and we have to suffer the pain of rejecting the flesh. We have to take up our cross, crucify our old nature, and then move in God's direction. We have to clean up our plate. As difficult as that might sound, we have hope. As miserable as we are and as rebellious as we've, as we've been, we still have hope. Paul said in Romans 3 that God isn't just the God of the Jews, but he's also God of the Gentiles. God is the God of all, whether we recognize him to be or not. Just because you don't worship God or you don't serve God doesn't mean that you won't be judged by God. But God loves you too. And according to Galatians 3, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us that the blessing of Abraham, the father of the Jews, might come on us Gentiles also through Jesus Christ that we Gentiles might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The Spirit of God that was available only to the Jewish race has now been made available to you and me. And now if we ask, we'll receive. If we knock, the door will be open. If we seek, we're going to find God's wonderful gift of salvation and the satisfaction uh, to the great void that we've had in our life. So my question to you today is, what do you seek after? Do you seek after God and righteousness, or have you been swept up in this current of seeking after other things? Where are you invested? Maybe you've given your life to God and you've been saved from your sin, but you still seek after the wrong things. Like the prodigal son, you still want control. You refuse to be obedient, and your Christianity is a mess. There is no structure, and when there is no structure, there is no blessing. Your prodigal son or a prodigal daughter and your rebellion will eventually lead you away from your father and lead you into destruction. Or maybe you're trying to be a good Christian. You're trying to be obedient, but God has put something on your plate that you don't want to deal with. Going to heaven when you die and living your life here in obedience to God are two separate issues. You can be God's child, but still be a disobedient child. He may want to reward you, but because you refuse to obey him, he can't. You have strained your relationship with your heavenly father, and your disobedience is frustrating his fatherliness. We live in a monetary world. It's just the way it is. Everything runs on money. So money is what most of us seek after. We seek after money because we believe that money is the key to the vault that holds all of the things that we want in life. 
So sometimes in our seeking, we fall into the same pit that consumes most of the people in our world. We've become flesh-minded instead of spirit-minded. We're still God's child, and he is our father. We're saved from our sin and on our way to heaven. We bear his name, we attend church, we read our Bible, we help with ministry, but we refuse to do all that God asks us to do. And we're getting no ice cream. If you know that you're saved, but your Christianity isn't working for you right now, your prayers never seem to be answered, life is a struggle, your joy is missing, might I suggest that it's because you're leaving something undone that God has asked you to do. In an Easter egg hunt, all of the eggs are hidden for you, but they're not hidden from you. They're placed as a challenge to create excitement, but they're not so hidden that it's impossible for you to find them. Nobody has to prompt a child to go look for the eggs. As a matter of fact, most kids will even let you rehide the eggs so they can find them again. God wants you and me to be like little children. He wants us to have a childlike faith. He wants us to understand that he loves us and we can trust him. We're so intellectual in our interpretation of God and so analytical that we sometimes rob ourselves of the blessings that God wants to give us and we rob him of the pleasure of letting us have them. We're too busy trying to figure it all out. We're busy analyzing what God is going to do and how God is going to do it or even if God is going to do it. Sometimes we're even telling God how to do it. We're complaining about what God has put on our plate. We complain that it is unfair or it's unnecessary, but we don't know what God knows. We don't understand that what God has put on a plate is the best thing for us in the long run, and we don't trust him. God wants you to grow up in your faith, and, and as you get more mature and grow closer to God, you might find that he doesn't move as quickly as he did when you first met him. You'll discover that he'll bring things into your life that you're unfamiliar with and things that make you uncomfortable. There will be trials and there will be challenges, but you have to learn to trust your father. Is there something on your plate right now that you don't want? You didn't ask for it, you don't like it, and you don't want to deal with it. But there it is. Do you believe that God is sovereignly in control of all things at all times? If you do, then you know that God knows that it's there. And he has either placed it there or he has allowed it to be there. Trust him. I'm not telling you that you have to like it. But you do have to trust that God has your best interest in mind. And what's in front of you is what you would have ordered if you knew what God knows. One last thing. There may come a day when God will stop giving you ice cream. But by then, you'll have matured enough in your faith that you'll understand that there is something even better in store for you. You see, ice cream is temporary, but God has something for you that's eternal, where your obedience and your trust will be rewarded beyond your greatest imagination. The Bible says, for eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for his children. Clean up your plate. God knows best. Trust him. Even when everything inside of you wants to run away, trust him. Because he's your father, and he knows what's best.